Hey, good afternoon. My name is Ricardo Valerdi, and I'm going to uh, tell you some stories about baseball and systems engineering. So we're going to think of models in a broader sense, not necessarily as abstract representations or physical models, but we're going to think of models in terms of demonstrating. And we're, what we're going to demonstrate in this case is how baseball can make math and science fun for kids. So th this whole story started for me about uh, six or seven years ago. I was uh, in Boston and I was invited to give a talk at uh, one of these uh, defense companies. And at the end of the talk, uh, one of the uh, people in the audience came up to me and gave me this book called Moneyball. And if you haven't heard of it, it's a book about uh, the Oakland athletics team uh, in the early 2000s and how they used analytics to optimize how they drafted players. So this is one of these situations where you start reading the book and you can't put it down. And by the time I finished the book, I asked myself the question, why aren't we using baseball to get kids interested in math and science? So fast forward about six or seven years, and basically what I've been doing since then is initially as a hobby, uh, was taking baseball and using it as a model for the things that kids have to learn in school. Now, I need to be honest with you, I'm not really a New York Mets fan. The, I'm not. The only reason I'm wearing this shirt, it's because Mets is STEM backwards. So let's talk about baseball in particular. I know many of you have probably heard of it. Some of you maybe have uh, been to games. Uh, but we're going to play a little game called the number nine. And what this game is all about is I'm going to ask you a question about baseball. And the answer to every question is nine. Can you remember that? Just in case you can't, I'm going to help you. Okay. <laughs> so how many innings in a game? How many batters in the lineup? How many players on the field? What a bright audience. No, there's nine at one time, okay? So in a Major League Baseball season, there are 162 games in one season. What's one plus six plus two? Half of those games are played at home, 81 games. What's eight plus one? The distance between home plate and first base is 90 feet. What's nine plus zero? When you run all the way around the bases from home to first to second to third and back to home, you're running 90 feet four times. Four times 90 is 360. What's three plus six plus zero? Excellent. And, and the, I only have nine more. The, <laughs> the founder of baseball, Abner Doubleday, there are nine letters in his last name. And just to close the deal, what's one plus eight? <laughs> So baseball is not just about the math, it's, it's also about the science. And so I wanted to give you some examples of things that we've been using to model uh, these concepts uh, using baseball. We teach kids about biomechanics, for instance. The rotation of limbs, the rotation of shoulders is a really uh, hands-on way to understand angles. Physiology, uh, reaction time, I'm going to actually do a demonstration of that a little bit later. Launch angles, you see a giant protractor in the photo on the bottom left. Uh, launching a ball from about three feet above the ground and having it go as far as you possibly can is influenced by a lot of factors. One of them is launch angles. And of course, Newton's laws of motion, speed, acceleration, all these concepts apply not just to baseball, but actually to any sport. Let me give you a specific example of something that we've been using that is one of the topics that uh, sixth graders and eighth graders uh, have to learn, not, not just in this country, but uh, all, all around the world. So th one way to think about the Cartesian coordinate system is just by plotting points on an XY coordinate. But if you put this in the context of baseball, it starts to make a little bit more sense because it depends really where players should stand on the field is a very important uh, defensive decision. In fact, sometimes this changes. You might put players in different positions in different locations depending on who the batter is. 
And so we use the Cartesian coordinate system as a way to teach baseball. And kids actually think that they're using, that, that they're learning baseball, which they are, but they're also learning math at the same time. So the difference between the graph on the left and the one on the right is that the origin is in a different location. You can either put the origin at home plate or you could put the origin at second base. And the difference is, on the right, you're using all four quadrants of the coordinate system, which is more advanced for about eighth grade level. Uh, but the same principles apply. It matters a lot where you put the players because their job is to catch the ball before it hits the ground. And ultimately, uh, as you see in, in the bottom diagram, they have to know, the students have to know where the players stand, but also how the players are refer to. So in, in baseball, we have a shorthand system of referring to players. We don't call them by, their, uh, by the name of their position. We call them by a number. So for instance, position one is pitcher. Then we have catcher, first base, second base, third baseman, shortstop, left fielder, center fielder, and right fielder. How many players on the field? Good job. All right. So this concept, we've actually evolved it to just be on not just baseball, but basketball, soccer, and American football, which should be called handball because you rarely kick it with your foot. You usually hold it with your hand. So, so these are, uh, the, the football we know is played uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, but th these are some uh, other programs that we've developed uh, with professional sports teams. And, and two of those teams are actually located close to where we are now, the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. And, uh, and as you can see, the, what happens with these organizations is that their interest is to grow fans. And the strategy for them is if you can get a, an eight-year-old kid to start following the sport at a very young age, they're going to become a lifelong fan. And for many of us, sport is like religion, right? I mean, Sunday, uh, used to be owned by the church, right? Now it's owned by the National Football League. Okay. So here's another example of uh, how we deploy the, the, uh, the program itself. Uh, the, in this picture, there's a lot uh, to discuss. The first thing that's obvious is in the forefront are the teachers. So what we do is we create lesson plans, curriculum, and we also provide materials to teachers uh, who then take it back to their classrooms. And we do this training uh, at baseball stadiums uh, because this is a, a really good environment to show and demonstrate things and actually have the teachers learn a little bit more about the sport. They already know about the math and science. Uh, they're now here to learn about the connection between uh, math, science, and in this case, baseball. This stadium in Phoenix, Arizona, close to where I live, uh, it's called Chase Field. And a few things to notice is it's a massive stadium, one of the biggest in terms of capacity. It seats almost 50,000 people. But there's a lot of technology, not just in the infrastructure, the structure itself, but on the right side, it has one of the biggest scoreboards in, in the sport. So a lot of statistics are displayed during the game, uh, a lot of highlights, but also you can see almost the, the score for every other game that's going on around the country. You might notice that uh, the, there's a uh, open, uh, it's open to the sky, but what you might know about Phoenix, if you've ever been there in June, July, or August, is that you would never want to be outdoors during those months because it's so hot. So in this case, we have a retractable roof that closes. It takes about three minutes to close, and then they, vent, they, they put air conditioning into the entire stadium, which, as you can imagine, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per game, but otherwise, nobody would go uh, to a game uh, in the summer in Phoenix. So a lot of really interesting themes and connections to make uh, for students when they come to the stadium, they actually uh, can appreciate and, and know a little more about what's going on. And by the way, you see a Canadian flag up there on the right side because there is one uh, professional baseball team, part of Major League Baseball, uh, that's in Canada. If anybody uh, can tell me who that is, you get bonus points. There we go. So one of the newest uh, baseball stadiums in Major League Baseball is in Atlanta. Uh, and, and first, I want to point out to you that baseball or any sport can be seen uh, through multiple lenses. And so my favorite quote is this, to understand baseball, you first try physics, then physiology, then psychology. 
And once you look at a game through those lenses, it becomes a lot more interesting and a lot more entertaining. But this particular stadium in Atlanta, SunTrust Park, is one of the highest technologically advanced stadiums uh, in the world now because it has not just high-speed Wi-Fi, but also Doppler radar. And what they use the Doppler radar for is they track where players are moving around the field to an extremely detailed level. I mean, this is military technology, so instead of tracking missiles, they're tracking baseball and baseball players. They can actually measure the spin rate of a baseball as it leaves the pitcher's hand and travels 60 feet towards home plate. So what's beneficial for us is that if we want to use baseball to teach uh, math and science, there are terabytes of data that are created after every game. And most of it is freely available. So it's a, it's a great laboratory, a great playground to do this kind of work. Uh, since we're talking about stadiums, I wanted to point out another interesting feature about baseball. And in, in this representation, you see two things. The first one is the bird's eye view profile of a particular stadium in Major League Baseball. There are 30 of them. Okay, nothing to do with the number nine in that case. <laughs> but the bird's eye view of the stadium tells you a very interesting feature about the sport. No two stadiums are alike in terms of their dimensions. So it makes the game very interesting. In some cases, you're playing at uh, Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado, where the ball travels a lot farther, or you're playing at sea level uh, at Dodger Stadium here in Los Angeles. So the aerodynamics are a little bit different. The other thing that you see is a profile of the outfield wall. Again, no two stadiums are the same because in some cases the outfield wall may be farther, it may be closer, it may be taller, or it may be shorter. And you can think of all the geometry and physics themes that can be extracted from this idea uh, just by simply looking at the stadium. Now, uh, a quick story. I, like I mentioned, this started for me in Boston when I was living uh, and had been converted to uh, being a Red Sox fan. Uh, and, and then I moved to Arizona in 2011, and one of the uh, things that I wanted to do during that trip was to visit as many ballparks as possible. And so you can imagine starting out here in the Northeast and going all the way to the Southwest, you can actually hit a lot of stadiums. So in uh, statistics, they call this the traveling salesman problem. And in this case, what I wanted to do was minimize miles driven, and maximize beer, uh, excuse me, ballparks visited. And w when I brought this up to my wife, um, she was not interested in joining me in this adventure, um, but said that she would fly to Arizona and meet me there. And, uh, and so what I, I, ex I explain this to students a lot because uh, this is a very practical thing. You're trying to minimize cost on the trip and you're trying to maximize utility. In this case, utility is how many ballparks you visit. But it's actually not that simple because you also have to match up the home schedules of each of the teams that you'd like to visit. So it becomes actually a, a, a very interesting problem to try to solve mathematically and, and it also depends on when you want to leave and when you want to arrive. So I did all these uh, spreadsheets. I spent a lot of time on it, maybe more than I should have, but uh, at the end, I actually found a website called baseballroadtrip.com <laughs> that does it all for you. <laughs> so let, let's talk about baseball cards, because baseball cards are an interesting medium that's actually um, it, it's dying in popularity because uh, most things are done electronically now, but I wanted to to leave you with a memento. So if you have a baseball card in front of you, just stretch out at the chair in front of you. You might see a baseball card there and grab it. It's your memento for the day. And if, and if any of you find the Mickey Mantle rookie card, I will give you $5 for it. <laughs> so in, in some cases, you might have a baseball card that has uh, statistics on it. Uh, and, and what you might notice is that there, there, there are a lot of numbers on there. And, and some of them are what we call count statistics, which mean how many home runs did you have, or how many hits did you have, or how many times did you get uh, to bat the ball. So those are count statistics. And in other cases, uh, in the far right of this example, you have what's called slugging percentage and batting average. Those are rate statistics. So those are ratios of how successful you were at the plate. 
divided by the number of attempts uh, that you took. And, and so this is a third grade level math, so you don't get intimidated. You're not gonna be asked to do any of it, but just think about how basic uh, sports data can entertain even just a third grader. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to explain to you is, is a short story of uh, when we visited some of these schools. Uh, this particular photo was taken in Dallas, Texas. And we did these activities with baseball cards with the kids, and, and we were uh, throwing baseball cards, and they were catching them, and they were counting how many of the cards they were catching successfully. And, and about 30 minutes later, we collected all the data. We made histograms and bar charts and scatter plots, and the, and the kids were very excited. And, uh, and at the end of the activity, they came up to me and, and they said, thank you so much for helping us skip math class today. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, that's exactly what we wanted, right? So, so it's almost for those of you who uh, know Flintstone vitamins, uh, they taste really good and they're actually good for you as well. It's kind of. And so this is the same idea, is that this is fun, you're doing sports, you're, you're no longer inside the classroom, you're now outside on the field, so you feel like you're getting away with murder here because you're still, uh, you're still using class time, but now you're out uh, in the field doing an activity. So uh, it's sort of as a closing message, I want to ask you to do a, a quick activity with me just to illustrate the takeaway, the takeaway point for you. So if I could ask you to just stand up where you are. You're not gonna need a lot of room to do this. What I need you to do is put your right index finger up in the air. Okay? And what I'd like you to do is draw a clockwise circle above your head, almost like a halo. Nice halo above your head, you're going clockwise. Okay? So look up, just to double check, a little V and V, is it going clockwise? Okay? So keep moving your hand in the clockwise motion and slowly start bringing it down to around eye level. Okay, and slowly start bringing it down to about chest level and then belt level. Which direction is your hand moving in now? It should be moving counterclockwise. Let's do it again. <laughs> right index finger up in the air. You're going clockwise. 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that's clockwise. Okay, slowly bring your hand down, moving in the same direction, eye level. Keep bringing it down at chest level and belt level. What direction is it moving in now? Counterclockwise. Great, you can have a seat. So the takeaway there is that if you are looking at a system or a phenomenon, but you change your perspective, you get an entirely different answer. Okay? And that's the whole idea here, is instead of looking at math as something that abstract and boring and difficult, all you need to look at it is change your perspective and use sports to look at it, and all of a sudden it becomes fun and engaging. Now, just to tell you something, this presentation is supposed to be 18 minutes long. What's one plus eight? <laughs> okay. 